Welcome back to Three Point Firefighter. As always, I am an AI-generated voice and not the real Jake Barnes. As you can probably tell, I do not possess the raw sexuality and erotic tenacity of the real Jake. Today's guest is Mike Goldstein, or as some call him, Stickers. He uh, worked as a bouncer in a, a dive bar, and you know he even ran with an MC for a little bit. Uh, Michael has always had a, a calling to help others, though and started his career in the first responder field in 2005 as a dispatcher for a private ambulance company. Stickers met his future wife a few years later, and her father inspired him to become a firefighter. He got his start as a call firefighter in 2012, and it was all over after that. He was hooked. He was hired uh, as a career firefighter and uh, continued to find his passion for the service. He is a staff state instructor for the NH Fire Academy and has currently been with the Dairy Fire Department for almost a year. He is very passionate about IT, hose, ops, volunteer uh, to help run the NH Explorer Academy, and also very passionate about mental health and leading a positive lifestyle inside and outside the fire service. And with that, Michael Goldstein. Today's episode is brought to you by Fire Facilities. Make training count with their custom-made, all-steel, live-fire training facilities. Their made-in-the-USA towers and burn rooms are the best for preparing, responding, and surviving the challenges you face every day. It's a cola, isn't it? In it yeah. Down, yeah. Okay. How long is that down there? Three days. We're going to be down there, getting there Monday night, tonight, and mm-hmm. then we'll be there till uh, Thursday, leaving Friday. Oh, nice. Nice. Yeah. Does, your par- uh, does your department let you off to do that, or do you got to use your own time? You got to take my own time for that. Um, unfortunately, just budgets, you know, it's tough trying to pay people to go to trainings. They fully endorse it, but it's just hard money wise to to spend the money to, especially Pensacola, it's super expensive to get there. Yeah. <laughs> it's not so, that far from me. I get, we can drive there in about 10 hours. So, um, an area I'm in, a lot of people will drive down there. We went down to Destin, I don't know, June, I think, because it's so cheap, but you're way up there in, in uh, New York. New Hampshire. New Hampshire. New Hampshire. Sorry. Why did I say New York? New Hampshire. New Hampshire. Yeah. I mean, I was just up there. That's how I met you. <laughs> right. <laughs> that was a great uh, training academy there. That academy was no joke. It, they actually have a really good training grounds. And now that we have that water mapping prop, uh, it just ups our training facility even more. I hope we get a lot of use out of it because once I saw it being built and I heard what it was for, I was super excited. I jumped right on that program. Um, I love learning new techniques and having that up there, being able to show our our new students, new ways, new strategies, new techniques. It's it's a game changer. It is. And I like I hate how well, this this is not a hump century, but when I when I got in the fire service, it was almost like a firefighter was um uh, it wasn't looked down upon, but it wasn't like like it is today. Right? And the way it is today is that firefighters are, are intelligent, they're professional. Um we use science to do what we do. And I think that prop is mm. exact, a great uh, example of that is you can over and over and over again, show exactly what the air and water is doing in a box. And it's repeatable yep. and it's, it's a great, that's, that is definitely my favorite training prop since I've been a firefighter. I've never, that thing is amazing. And I've, I've been in a bunch of them and every single time I'm like, I cannot believe that it took this long to figure out what water does you know, in a box or how we should do it. So. Well, it's great. Can you think about it? Water is our, is our weapon. Yep. We use it to attack an object to make things better for ourselves. We need to figure out how to use the weapon to our advantage. Right. And this water mapping prop shows how you can use that to your advantage. It's like using a machine gun versus strategically using, uh, you know, a semi-automatic, uh, you know, amp, uh, sorry, gun, uh, is that you? You can you know exactly where this bullet is going to go, as opposed to just you know pray and spray. Uh, it's same way with water. You know, for so many years, 
That's all we did. We just bully our way in, throw water everywhere until the house floated off the foundation. And then we, you know, broke our arms, slapping each other on the back saying, hey, what a kick ass firefighter we were. When in fact, you know, we need to be more strategic, more. uh, Well, what's where I'm looking for? Cat penis, maybe. I don't know. (laughs) (laughs) I agree. Like, I think about it when we when we did that class, like the biggest thing that came to my mind was garden style apartments. Mm -hmm. And like you guys talked about in the classroom, like you're going down that hallway and you've got a room that's blowing. Why are you going to go all the way down and have to deal with all that thermal injury Mm -hmm. when you could bank it down, hit the lentil, go into that apartment and pull the fire. Absolutely. Instead, like you said, back in the day, we would kill ourselves to get down the highway, uh, the hallway and then finally make way to that apartment. It just, it's simple science, but we just never thought about it that way before. It, you know, it is, it is simple science. And it, it, we should have known this, but the funny thing is, I remember the first academy I went through was through the military, through the Air Force. And one of my instructors was belaboring the point that you don't spray water until you see fire. And how he got in trouble, he went through the dorms as a, as a room of contents fire, basically in a dorm. And he was pushing down the hallway and he was throwing water up in the hallway, up in the ceiling area uh, to try to make things a little bit cooler. He, For him, he said he, he wanted it to rain down on him to make him cooler, right? What he was doing was the stuff that we taught you is that he was contracting those gases, but he got in so much trouble for that. And he was trying to relay that to us. He's like, oh, you don't want to spray water on smoke. That's not fire. But. The whole time he was right. I mean, that, that's what we, we need to be doing. And I think that's when ego gets in the fire service. And anybody that's listening to this podcast knows ego, for me, is one of the biggest problems we have in the fire service. We want to push that hallway to melt our helmets and see how tough we are. And, you know, we don't – I feel like we don't consider who's in there without firefighter gear, you know? Like, if it's hot and nasty for us with our gear, imagine what it's like for little Jimmy and his – uh, Spider-Man pajamas on the ground. So it's, it's, it's literally unbearable. So yeah. yeah, if we take, if we ever take that ego out of our job, at least, you know, the bad part of the ego, I know we need some of it, but I feel like if we, if we start focusing on our, on our community first, our, our victims, people pay our taxes, uh, we're going to do a much better job. I think. 100%. So brother, I was, you have had quite a life. Now, <laughs> so you're a firefighter in New Hampshire, right? Yep. What got you started in the fire service? Well, uh, I started working in dispatch uh, for a private ambulance organization called Rock and Regional Ambulance, now defunct. Uh, it was a great company, but we worked in conjunction with National Fire Rescue. So we did their ambulance side of the things for them. So. The city contracted us for ambulances. We also did wheelchair transports and whatnot. But it was really cool to work side by side with National Fire, um, talking with them on the phone and on the radio. And I built a great rapport with them. And then I started wanting to do more of their side of their work. It was really interesting. But I really love dispatching, too. I actually still do it part time. Uh, So... Fast forward, I met my, uh, at the time I was dating this girl. She's now my wife. Um, her father was retired deputy chief out of Nashua. And he said to me, hey, you're a strong guy. You look like you could lift things up and put them down. You'd be a great <laughs> firefighter. Because <laughs> back in the day when he started, that, that's what it was. Like if you can lift things and put them down and not afraid to go to tall buildings and, and do some crazy shit, you're our guy. So he's like, you would, you would really be good at that. Uh, so he's the one that actually put the bug in my ear and said, you should really do this. So my wife and I, we moved to Milford, New Hampshire, and they have a call department, uh, you know, volunteer call. So it was, uh, that's where I got my start in the fire service was coming to Milford, New Hampshire and joining the fire department there, cutting my teeth there. And it's actually a really good department very active. They do a lot of calls. We have a bypass. So we get a lot of motor vehicle accidents. Uh, we go mutual aid to a lot of places. So, uh, without my father-in-law pushing me to do it, I probably would have never actually gone to it. 
I didn't know where to go. So in New Hampshire, it's a little different. You have to get all of your certifications, then get your CPAT, and then apply to a fire department, and hopefully they hire you. Mm-hmm. So like in Massachusetts, you apply, they hire you, then they send you to your academy. If you pass that, you go back, and you start your job. So it's a little bit more difficult, and that's why for me I started later in life because I didn't have a direction. I didn't know how I could get into the fire service. And so, without my father-in-law, he wouldn't have got me there. Is it safe to say, I'm going to repeat back what you said and see what you think of this. Your father-in-law wanted you to take on a very dangerous job. Now, did you and your father-in-law get along before this? Is he trying to get rid of you, get you out of the picture? <laughs> Come on, man, talk to me. <laughs> so it was really, uh, I think, because he loves the fire service. And that was his biggest thing. He, Him and I have a great rapport. We love each other. Uh, and I think he wanted to see his passion go on to the next. He doesn't have any sons. So when we became closer and built a relationship, he wanted to see that, in a way, a legacy carry on. Even though I'm not his son, he can actually still live that passion through me, through all the stories I have to tell now. And his his father was also a uh, firefighter in a neighboring town called Hudson. Mm-hmm. So and now my daughter is in the Explorer Academy, and she's got the bug now, and she wants to try the fire service, hopefully. Oh, yeah. It's um, it's great to get your family in it and have, you know, generation after generation pick up and, and, and where you left off. I think it's amazing. I, you know, I love, I love the fire service. Uh, now, you didn't – so you're a lot like me. You didn't, like, want to be a firefighter when you are a little kid, right? So you had some pretty cool jobs. So what are yeah. some of the, the, the weirder jobs you've had before being a firefighter? So I had a temp job when I moved back to New Hampshire. I lived in Maryland for a bit. And then when I was in Maryland, I worked for a biotech company. And I pretty much sat in a uh, hood, they called it. It's an air-controlled system. And what I did all day was I broke down blood vials. So I would take a pipette. And I would take blood samples, and I would literally break them down into smaller vials so they could do cancer research with that. Right. So that was in Maryland. It was a whole biotech corridor. And I loved living in Maryland, but I missed New Hampshire. I missed all my friends. Missed the area. So I moved back. I worked for a temp agency, uh, and I had to make um, pharmaceuticals for a startup company. And that sucked balls. I hated every moment of that job. Right. <laughs> So that was a temp job. It was paid really well, but I had to sit in a controlled room for eight hours and have to put this pharmaceuticals into eye droplets. Mm -hmm. And you would end up getting these huge blood blisters on your fingers trying to squeeze down the droplet, you know, the the plastic thing. Right. So because you you had to control your movement, so you couldn't move very fast. So you literally had to move very slow with tweezers, put it in there, put it aside, because everything was monitored. You had all these little plates that collect particles and bacteria, and if they got big hits, you had to destroy the sample, make a new batch, and then do it over again. And we would beat it until 3 o'clock in the morning because the shit had to get done. That sounds terrible. It was horrible. <laughs> oh, my God. So then I was sitting in that, that building thinking how much I hated my life, and so I was looking in the paper, and I found the ad for Rockingham Ambulance. And I saw the, the description. I go, I could do that. It's easy enough. So I uh, applied to Rockingham Ambulance, and they gave me that job. Uh, while I was doing that, I was also working for a place called Panucci's, which is a bar in Nashua. Mm-hmm. It's, a, it's kind of a hole in the wall. Well, it was a hole in the wall. It's gotten a lot better. But uh, After you left? It got <laughs> After better. I left, it got better. <laughs> and that was my jam. Like Panucci's was like where all our friends would go. It was your it was your cheers. It was the hole in the wall where everyone knew your name. You walk in there, they already had your beer ready for you. It was filled with cigarette smoke. It had glass on the floor. Usually it was a fight every weekend. Uh so I started to become a bouncer there. And it was great because I could smoke cigarettes, talk to chicks. Get free beer, maybe get in a fist fight. <laughs> Did you ever have to bounce your friends out of that? Out of that bar? I've had to, I've had to bounce acquaintances. 
Wow. But I never actually had to balance friends for the most part, like good friends. Like it was kind of crazy because I had a habit of getting into fist fights there, mm-hmm. even while I was working there. So it was my friends and I getting in fights with other people. So <laughs> we even booted out of there a couple of times and got allowed to go back. Um, we'd make our rounds around Nashua and getting fist fights around bars and stuff. But that was when I was young and stupid. But I got to move up to be a bartender there. So I enjoyed both worlds of being a bouncer, being a bartender. And I, honestly, it was actually a pretty cool gig. Met a lot of cool people. Actually, it's where I met my wife. <laughs> so I was working the bar there, working the door, and my wife just set her lasers right on me. Mm-hmm. And she says, I'm going to go out with that guy. And so she was there all the time, hanging out with people. She started talking to me. Her mom said, you'll never find anybody at a bar. I don't know why you keep going to bars. <laughs> and then she met me, and uh, she got her hooks in me, and then it just stuck. Wow. I'd love, I mean, I'd love to have a story like that about my wife, like, like looking at me and latching on, but that wasn't the case. I, I, be, I think I just begged so bad. I was, you know, she's just like, fine, whatever. I don't care anymore. So I give up. I give up 20 years later. She's like, ah, oh, fuck it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So I loved working at the bar and like, uh, we were talking about earlier. I, um, I met some cool people, but then I met a guy who, uh, rode with the motorcycle club. And I uh, love to ride bikes. He said, hey, if you love to ride bikes and hang out with people, you should come hang out with us. So I started hanging out with him and then um, started doing the prospect thing. Mm-hmm. And I never carried through with getting becoming a patched member. Uh, it was really towards the end of my prospecting phase where I was almost there to get to get my patched in. But I decided it wasn't the best thing for me. I was going to have. I think at that time, actually, I was going to have kids. Mm-hmm. So I wasn't going to want to have kids and be part of a motorcycle club. Just wasn't going to mesh. And then my job at Rocking and Ambulance, I didn't want to screw that up. Things were starting to get serious with my with my girlfriend. And the bad, sometimes bad things happen, right? So I kind of had that feeling in the back of my brain, like, probably need to get rid of something. And since we were having kids, I also – ended up selling my bike so I could afford getting uh, car seats and, you know, an actual nice car for my, for drive the family around. I didn't have a lot of money back then, obviously. So we lived in a 800 square foot apartment, barely could fit in it with the, the two of us alone. That I had twins right off the bat. So. Oh, wow. Yeah. It's, uh, it was interesting. Uh, I feel bad for you when they become teenagers. Oh my God. Dude, Kids they are- already are. No, are they already teenagers or too young? Yeah, they're 14. They're going to be 15 in uh, this month, uh, November. Oh, I'll be praying for you. I'll be praying for you, brother. <laughs> oh, my God. I've had – I got four sex trophies, and they, they're all through the teenage years. But, man, that was tough. That was tough. They're good kids. Uh, you just got to stay away from them when they wake up in the morning. Mm-hmm. You don't talk to them. Um, you just let them roam around the house, and you just act like you don't exist. I realize now that I'm – I'm an Uber and DoorDash. <laughs> That's it. <laughs> <laughs> well, I will say this. Uh, my kids, they, they came out of it. I mean, especially, so I had a boy and three girls. So my girls, uh, around 17, I noticed that they started coming out of that horrible phase and started becoming, uh, you know, more like peers. And, and, you know, you could have conversations with them again. But, yeah, it's like you put food in the hallway and then you'd kind of hang back and then you'd watch them slowly come out like little animals and grab the food and close the door. And of course, everything you say and do is wrong. You have no mm-hmm. life experience to back up anything you say. <laughs> yeah, being a parent is uh, just basically somebody else telling you what an idiot you are. That's, that's how it works. Oh, and yeah. I just realized you said sex trophies. Yes. That's, or okay, kids. I call my kids sex trophies because that's what they are. Right? They? Yeah. 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 The trophies for having sex. <laughs> <laughs> so you did, uh, you, so you did all the stuff. And then uh, when I meet you, obviously your passion for the fire service is there, right? I mean, you're that guy. Uh, you were, we were up there training and you were just like always first one to do something. You never had any quit about you. You just kept going on and on. To be fair, a lot of the uh, instructors up there were like that, if not all of them. The, oh, yeah. So we were doing, uh, for those listening, we were doing our very last grant funded engine ops class. And it was in New Hampshire at their fire academy. And 
the way it works is day one, all the instructors get there. They learn the material, they learn the skill stations, and then day two, students come in and then they teach the students. And then we hang around to make sure that everything is within the same parameters as we taught, which it was. But that was one of the absolute best classes. Now, we haven't had a bad class. Don't get me wrong. I'm not saying, oh, I had a shitty class here. We've had great classes. Some stick out more, though. And this was one of them. And uh, the way you all all got together, it was clear you all work very, very well together. And, yeah. um, you know, had the UL prop and, you know, we had some scenarios and stuff. But it's just for me, it does a lot for my soul my firefighter soul to be around that many people that love the job when you can just feel the passion in the air. Um, tell me some of your takeaways from that, that you really liked that you think, did you have any aha moments? Like, Oh shit. I haven't even thought about that. Uh, it really was uh, talking about how you changed the, the verbiage, if you will, like not the transitional attack, you know, it's exterior attack mm -hmm. uh, really showing us that there's, the old school way of transitional attack is, is no good or doesn't work. Showing us how to apply that water, that technique, that, those tactics. Because um, like you said, it wasn't a hose movement class. It wasn't about hose advancement. It was about trying to get to the seat of the fire, trying to knock down those gases to make our jobs easier, to make our victims more survivable. Uh, <laughs> the biggest takeaway for me was showing the science behind it. All the videos that UL lit um, was really uh, prominent for me to see the science and the movement behind it. Cause you could talk about it, but if you don't see it, then you're not going to sell the person on it. Mm -hmm. So you guys did so well with explaining why it needs to be done. Here are the reasons, here's the situations that it happened in. And here's the hundreds of studies with documented and video and all these other gauges they use to document this proof. Mm -hmm. So I, it's, it's hard to narrow really down the one aha, but for me it was the science, I think. Of, of you showing us and explaining us the science behind it. Because if you don't have that, then people aren't going to buy into it. No, that's that's exactly true. And even with the science, people tend, uh, some people tend not to buy into it. It has, I haven't noticed that from anybody um, in any of the classes that I, I've been fortunate to be part of a cadre of. But usually it's people that aren't in that class or have taken that class they refuse to believe the science because they have an experience that is different, right? Yeah. Um, and you cannot convince somebody that their experience is wrong until that experience fails them, right? And, you know, they base their success on lack of failure. Like, oh, I break out every, I mean, my department, I, I mean, I got bosses that uh, to this day want every window broken out of the house, right? Mm -hmm. While there's a team in there because it's supposed to release all the heated gases. Uh, come on, bro. <laughs> I mean, it's terrible. And, and you try to show them this stuff and they don't, they don't believe in it. Now, my favorite are the people that absolutely won't believe it, but then they, they learn it and then they change their mind. Those, those yeah. are my all time favorites because I like somebody that's a little skeptical. Uh, I work with a lot of uh, instructors that I've been blessed to teach with. And some of them have been very skeptical, but they, they learn it, they apply it, and then they're just on the other side of that coin. They're like, holy shit, this is the real deal. It goes back to the ego thing. I believe that people don't want to learn this kind of stuff. They don't believe this kind of stuff because then they're going to have to say at some point they were doing the wrong thing, right? They were doing the wrong thing. And that's not the case. I feel like that we do the best we can with what we got. But once there's new information out there, it's it's our responsibility to learn it. and. Well, I think with, uh, I, I'm sorry, I didn't mean to cut you off, but you sparked a thing for me. Is that no problem. I don't think also they, it's the wrong way for them. A lot of people have been schooled by the older generation that anything new is bad. Mm -hmm. And so they've always been taught that way until they actually get to learn from people like you. And now me, you keep spreading that. Poison, if you will, the good yeah, poison. The good poison. The good poison of bringing new information into science instead of having somebody who's been in the job for 30 years, and this is the way I always do it. Then yeah. all those other generations go, yeah, what well, you're saying is shit. I'm listening to the old guy, but he's never taken a new class. Mm -hmm. So it's not that he doesn't want to believe you. He doesn't want to even try it. And so the old newer guy is like, well, my chief says, 
you're you're a shit. And I refuse to go to any classes because his science is true. Your yeah. science is not. Right. And that's I mean that's basing your success on lack of failure. That is the whole uh normalization of deviance, the challenger explosion, that whole nine yards, right? Just because you haven't uh had any failures doing it your way, you assume your way is the best way. And when in fact what we're doing is we're just we're just being lucky is all it is. And yeah. uh, there's there's so much smarter and better ways out there. And what kills me is this this information is free. You don't have to take it from ISFSI, from any of us. You don't have to take any of these classes, for, even though they're free. They're free online right now from FSRI. And uh, it's really exciting to see the fire service change based on science. Because, you know, so much of what we did was was sort of in the gray. Everything we did in the fire service, it seemed like, was in the gray, with the exception of uh, EMS. EMS was that, if this, then that, you know, uh, and it was very science-based. And if you think about it, you go back and look at it, you're like, man, the fire department, the fire service should have been science-based a long time ago because EMS has been in there, hazmat has been in there. But for whatever reason, people want to uh, put all their beliefs on their experience. And I'm not poo-pooing anybody's experience, but learn why your experience worked. Learn why it didn't work. You know, be honest mm -hmm. and open. Um, the, you talk about the older generations. Um, you look at, uh, you know, when I came on, it was like, hey, shut up. Don't say a word. For a whole year, you just sit there and learn. And yep. then I see some of that today, and I'm like, that's just absolutely wrong, man. I mean, for some reason, people, when they hear millennials or, or the uh, alphas or Gen Z, they're like, Oh, that's horrible. It's immediately horrible. I'm sorry. Anybody that puts in an application to be a firefighter, I don't care what age they are, they automatically get a pass with me. I'm like, okay, maybe there's something to these people. You know, let's let's learn about them. Let's let them learn our job. But yeah. how are you going to know what new people know if you tell them to shut up for a year? By then, by then, it's ingrained in them to be to shut up or or not have any, you know, uh, drive because uh, they're they're waiting for you to tell them what to do. What are your thoughts well, on, on the younger generation, too? Because you, as an instructor, you see a ton across the board. Absolutely. Uh, you hit the nail on the head with, with that. I feel more of it's like a being, teaching it to be submissive. Mm -hmm. I'm a 20-year-old vet. You listen to me, you bow down, you're submissive until I tell you not to be submissive. Uh, I never believe in that. I believe everyone has an opinion. Everyone brings value to the table. So when I'm teaching at the academy, they're new to it, but they're not idiots, right? Mm -hmm. You go into this as an instructor and say, you know nothing. I've been here for such and such years. I'm going to teach you everything fine. And you can teach me nothing about life. You're not going to teach them anything. So I treat everyone with respect. Everyone comes from walks of life. Everyone has experience. I believe that your experience in life can apply to fire service. Like for me, we just talked about the motorcycle one, right? Mm -hmm. Being a prospect is a hell of a lot like being a program. You have to clean the clubhouse. You can't sit at the table with them. You have to earn your way, and you have to earn the respect. So standing as probation, it's the same thing. You have to earn the right to sit at the table. doesn't mean you have to go sit outside and in the, in the pig trough, but you have to earn your way and show that you're not a scumbag. Right. So same thing with the fire instructor. It's not my job to, to show them I'm not a scumbag, that I'm going to treat you with respect. I'm not going to hurt you. There's nothing... I wouldn't do, I'm not going to make you do. So I never talk down to any of the students. I'll never come at them and say, you don't know anything, just keep your mouth shut. Because there's been times where a student said, hey, well, how come we don't do it that way? Like, you know what? It's a great idea. Yeah. Let's try it. <laughs> so it's being humble and it's having humility. And I think you see all those good instructors out there, they've had to deal with being humbled at one point in their life. And that's what makes you those instructors that people remember 
to ages. Because if you're not humble and you're always sitting on your high horse, the only thing you remember is that guy was an asshole. I will never learn from him ever again. And those are those training scars. Mm -hmm. Exactly. I remember, uh, I think I may have told the story on here before, but uh, when I was learning how to back up crash trucks into the bay, like the very first time I was doing it, and um, I was struggling, right? So when I was done, when I, it took me like half an hour. I'd pull in, pull out, pull in, pull out. I was doing terrible. But I remember this guy. Are you talking about your, your sex trophies? My sex trophies. No, not my sex trophies. Okay. <laughs> this was the military, and I was backing <laughs> up a crash truck, and it took me forever. And then this guy, after I finally got it in there, and it was crooked as shit, he came over to me. And he said, I've never seen a, a crash truck uh, do a hula dance before. That's terrible. And then he walked off. And for the next three years, I didn't no matter. I don't care what, what that guy said. I was like, fuck him. I'm not listening to him. It's one thing to say that and then say something to the effect of, hey, let me show you how to do it. Or here's an idea. But just to come over and bash on somebody and then walk the fuck off. When, by the way, they weren't working. They were sitting there smoking cigarettes, drink coffee. I was like, man, fuck that guy. So. That taught me early on that, you know, you, if you're going to work with people for a better part of your adult life, why do you want to start out being an asshole? Now, absolutely. I, everybody that's listening, this is the end of part one with Michael Stickers Goldstein. And <laughs> come back next Monday when we're going to pick up the conversation where we're talking about the different generations in the fire service. Brother Michael, thank you for being on. <laughs> That would be a big one. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> All right, we're back. This is uh, part two with Michael Goldstein. Uh, I forgot to tell you, by the way, I do that. I got to cut it in half. But anyway, uh, so last week we were talking about the different uh, generations of the fire service. And I think we agree on this, is that we, you and I both want to make a better fire service. So what we have to do is kind of suppress our ego a little bit, open up our why valve and let that why come out. Cause that's what the younger uh, generations want. They want more whys. And my experience originally for me was I didn't know the why. So I was mad whenever I got asked why, why, why I was like, oh, I'm so mad. Um, and that's why I put that right there. That's my first uh, article I wrote in firehouse. And it was all about that. It was all about the generations, all about the why. And I didn't know the why. I was mad at somebody for asking me questions and I didn't know the answer to. At that point, I'd been on 20 years. Mm -hmm. I should have known the answer. So in today's fire service, um, I, people, when, when I bring up my opinions on the, the younger generation of fire service, I usually get this, uh, oh, so we just accept them and, you know, they're just part of the group automatically day one, you know, blah, blah, blah. I'm like, yes, 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 yes. I'm not saying they're the most experienced person. Experience is different. You, why would you not want them to uh, eat at the dinner table for you, with you? Now, we weren't allowed to eat at the dinner table and it was funny. So I had no trouble with the way I came in the fire service because the, the, the thing at the time in Lexington, Kentucky was uh, they, you had to eat out in the bay and the dog got to eat in the dining room. Ouch. Until you made uh, potato soup. It's still that way to this day. Uh, and you had to make potato soup for everybody. It was never mean. It was just a tradition. And none of us were upset about it. We thought it was really, really funny. It was funny that the dog, they would call the dog in to eat dinner. And then we had to sit on the tailboard. So it wasn't cruel. Now, balancing that, um, you know, hazing with, uh, you know, old school traditional jokes, that's, that's a hard line, right? Um, what have you experienced that you've done in the past that you would probably be okay with today with the new generation? And what are some of the things you would tear, you would never do ever again? So I was actually um, pretty lucky from both sides of the fence. When I started in Milford, it was, uh, it was Paul department. So we weren't there all the time. So we didn't, we didn't work shift work. Uh, it was, you knew you had certain people you didn't go up and talk to for quite some time because you were scared of them. Mm -hmm. uh, but no one ever forced me out that you couldn't eat at the big boy table, you know, that you couldn't sit in the same chair. Uh, I became a pro boot at Derry at 45 years old. I, oh, changed wow. I, I changed departments. So I was on Milford for uh, almost six years, and then I left there and went to Derry. So I started in older and wiser 
more, more saged and light. So the only thing for me is that there was people that I dealt with in my previous department that showed me how not to do it. Okay. Uh, just a someone who is just a mean spirited person. Uh, they played good jokes on me. I'll give him that. Like he did some good jokes, getting sprayed with uh, dry chems. You know, that was always <laughs> fun. I'd, I'd be in the shitter taking a piss or taking a shit, and he would come in there and spray the dry chem. Those are good humorous jokes. Loved it. You right. know, like, but uh, there were other days where you, you just when I walked out, I felt like shit. All right. And you always would second guess yourself, why am I doing this? So for me, the, the promotionary side of things, uh, for you guys, I will never have that part of you haven't earned my respect yet. Mm -hmm. That you have to sit on the other side of the table or you can't sit in other seats. If my officer says, hey, they can sit down with us in the leather seat because that's usually the recliners are where probies can't sit yet. Mm -hmm. But if we're having movie night, are we going to make them sit on the floor? No, we're not going to do that. Come on, sit up here. Enjoy the, the evening. You earned it for the day. So th for us, my department I'm at now, there is an old school mentality that you cannot look at us or you have to sit on the opposite side from the senior people or you can't sit in the recliner for movie night. It's unless they truly aren't earning their way. Right? They're not doing chores. They're not doing the probing manual. They, they just don't care to be there. Mm -hmm. In the end, I didn't earn it. More than likely, I go pull up an uncomfortable chair and you can sit on that side of the room. <laughs> but that hasn't happened since I've started in my new right. department. Uh, we've actually, with the new generation, and I've seen some really good solid kids. But the kids I've seen come through, they want to work. The ones who want to be here, you can see it. They're anxious. They're ready to come into work. Their gear is ready. They, they want to learn as much as possible for you, and they ask. I haven't met one new generation since I've started that we have to beg to do something or to train or to learn. So I know when the people talk about the new generation, and I haven't seen a lazy kid yet. No. No, and the ones that, that I've seen that talk the most shit about the new generations – are an old generation that really haven't got any, you know, haven't gone to a conference in 20 years, has, hasn't taken any extra classes. You know, they're just couch pilots and they want to sit there and, you know, again, seniority and experience, two different animals. You could be on for 30 years in the fire service, but you would just recycled that first year 30 times. Or right. you could be on for five years and have 10 years worth of experience because you take the classes, you go to the conferences, you try to learn from every single scene you go to, EMS or fire. And th those are the people that get me most excited about the fire service and, and who we're leaving it to. Um, but, yeah, the, the old heads, are ju they're just the worst. I, when somebody tells me stuff and all they've done is for their whole career, like they know when, uh, like you say, uh, we're going to do some training today. Well, Will of Fortune comes on at 7. You know, and then <laughs> I, I got my nap at noon. And then, you know, I'm like, if your schedule is based on what you need for you as opposed to what the community needs for them, go get fucked with the big sharp rock, in my opinion. Now, <laughs> I say that having been that guy. I've, I've been, been every piece of shit Everybody you can imagine. Everybody has a day, though. Right? Yeah, Everybody has a exactly. day where they don't want to do shit. Like, there's days where you don't want to put your gear on or you walk into shit but for whatever reason. It's just not feeling it for the day. Yeah. It happens. And that's Okay. And I think that's also an important thing that old and new generations need to understand that it's okay if you don't want to do something, if you're just not feeling it. Right. We're humans. We have emotions. The sun and the moon are aligned in a certain way, and you feel like shit, or you just don't have that motivation. But sometimes there are those people who see that in you, and they can get you motivated. And... I love to do that with the younger generation, the younger kids, and even the older generation. Hey, I, I want to try this new thing out with our gear today. Could we like, spare like 30 minutes to do something today? And at first, like, oh, all right, we'll see what we got. But, you know, we do it now. Before, it was 30 minutes. 
Now we've been doing it for an hour and a half. Right. That person who wasn't motivated is one who's now kind of leading the charge an hour in. So sometimes you can see those people who aren't motivated, but if you spark certain interest in them, man, you can get them going. It doesn't have to be a workout every day. Right? It doesn't have to be a down and dirty, sweat your ass off training, but it can be just a quick 30 minute. And like I said, all of a sudden we're doing it for an hour and a half. So. Yes. And the thing about it is if you put it like on a three shift cycle, one of your three shifts, you do nothing but maybe book work, magazine work, street work, something sitting down, relaxing. The second day you do something sort of, you know, you got your gear on, you're maybe pulling some lines around fire trucks in the bay, something medium, you get a little dirty, nothing crazy. And that third day, you just fucking give it all you got to where you have to have a shower before lunch because you fucking <laughs> got it, right? I think yeah. it could be something that simple. Um, I think a lot of times, I know when I was uh, in my height of bag of shitness, I remember when I hear the word training, uh, I would be like, ah, that sucks, blah, blah, blah. And I don't remember a single time, though, that I did training that I, I didn't leave kind of happy. I mean, oh, that was fun. I enjoyed that, you know, and I, I just think that people have this idea that, you know, you're you're humping hose up seven flights of stairs every day to call training. And that, that's not necessarily it. To me, training is a mindset. It's just staying in that mindset, doing something every day. So let's say you do come in uh, one day and you don't want to do a damn thing. So you're like, fuck, I'm just going to watch a few videos and be done with it. That's still way more than a lot of bags of shit will do. So your minimum is somebody else's maximum, right? So if you keep resetting that and, you know, putting in the hard work, when you decide to be lazy for a couple of days, shift, week, month, whatever, you're still probably doing way more than those bags of shit in the fire service that feel like they're, they're owed. They're owed the time off. This is my second job. Oh, no, I'm a, I'm a landscaper. This is my day off. I do this job <laughs> for the benefits and get the naps. Fuck you. Fuck all of you. Am I right? Is it just me? It's, it can't be just me. It can't be just you. It's it not can't just be you. just me. Brother, it ain't just me. Um, so we talked about the class that was grant funded. We're getting ready to kick off. The ISFSI is kicking off another grant funded class. The part of it that I'm helping to, de to develop is the RIT portion. Give me some of your thoughts on RIT because there's a lot of information out there. I don't say data. I, w I refuse to say data with some of the stuff we're talking about because it's kind of an insult to true scientific data. But there's great information out there on, on lost firefighters, down firefighters. Give me your, your uh, views on this. Uh, well, I think we need to work more on preventing it. Uh, of not needing red, right? Mm -hmm. So this ties in with the class I just took, the IFF Fire Ground Survival Course. Mm -hmm. I learned so much from that. Why we have these evolutions and scenarios, the story behind it, with the pain respect to the people that lost their lives and we learned from this. Mm -hmm. So I think red is super important. I think it's still a subject that we don't train enough on. And the biggest takeaway I got from the Fire Ground Survival was preventing the Mayday. We don't still do enough to read buildings, to do our 360s. Radio communication is a huge thing. We don't do enough to bring in our dispatchers to understand Maydays and how to use our radios. So, like, our emergency active problem. We, we half the people don't know what it is, where it is, or how how it works. Right. And we still have a lot of work to do, and that's why we'll always need RIT. We will make sure that we have confident people who are trained up on it. And that's the hard part too, is that we do a lot of RIT, especially in the smaller towns, that they kind of just touch on it. They don't really dive into it and work hard to make sure that they can respond when somebody goes down inside that building. So I, I do love it. I get really passionate about it. I talk about it a lot at work. And going down to Texas in last March was a, an amazing experience for the Dad Gum Conference. Mm -hmm. Listening to Robert Maris talk, basically Abraham uh, speak about RIT. 
Chris Snow talking about her. Uh, I mean, she said a plethora of instructions, but they're so passionate about it. And we have a guy up here. His name is Captain Steve Rosa. He's on Manchester Five. He experienced a mayday uh, about three years ago, and it was it was pretty significant. And the way he tells his story is so passionate and so emotional. I've heard it twice already. But every time I listen to him speak, you can't help but get choked up because he talks about how it was preventable. There was things that he did wrong. And he talks about that in detail. And so he now teaches the fireground survival as well. And it carries so much weight to hear him talk about his story and then train with us so we can be better and then train others to be better. Because I feel that writ is still very lax. And there's science behind it. There are numbers behind it. But it's also come down to just you're going to have to get sweaty. You're going to have to get dirty. You're going to have to do some really hard-ass work. And some people don't want to do that. No. And like Robert Maris says, if you can't truck, you can't rip. Yeah. It's that's, hard that's, work. It's exactly what it is. I, I love RIT for a lot of reasons. One, as a training officer, I love that it's uh, an informal skills and needs analysis. You do a RIT drill, and you don't tell people that you're paying attention. You know, other than the RIT, if it's a training officer, you're going to see how they search. You're going to see how they communicate. You're going to see uh, how they uh, package patients, how they make decisions. Uh, we still, for whatever reason, I've seen a lot of people that want to go out the door they came in as opposed to taking a couple seconds and looking for a window. I have ha had people tell me like, well, the window would be too hard for me. Yes, it's right there, but I know I can drag him. I, got, I came from that door over there. I know where I'm at. I'm oriented. It's a smooth surface. I'd rather go the longer way because it's going to be a shorter amount of time. I love when people say stuff like that to me, but I think, I think RIT is, is a great analysis for uh, training uh, instructors. Um, yeah, I, I'm with you. The, the, the numbers right now are showing that most of the people are found by interior crews, which is great. To me, that just means add more training to RIT. You have external RIT and internal RIT in my opinion. Um, I am, listen, I don't, I don't know if this is going to be popular or not. And it's not all <laughs> the way, it's not fleshed out all the way. So I'm going to throw it out there. Uh, I kind of think that RIT is almost a luxury for smaller departments because it's a resource hog. It's a gigantic resource hog. So my question is this, would you rather put those three people in the yard waiting or put them inside searching. Would you, you know what I'm saying? Um, and I know it's controversial, but I'm just getting to the point where I'm like, you know, those three people sitting in the yard would have probably been able to go in and find somebody, a victim, or help move a hose quicker than just sitting outside. So it's a resource thing. And now that the numbers are showing that most people are being saved by interior crews, now it's really doubling down on what I think. Uh, am I wrong? Am I just out of my fucking brain, uh, which for this, or, or do you think there's some, some a merit to that? Well, we have the numbers for this as self-rescue is the highest percentage, mm -hmm. right? So most RIT activations, that firefighter gets himself out, right? They find a window, they find a door, but they are able to self-rescue. So RIT is then canceled after that, right? Right. I think that the outside RIT crew still has work to be done before going inside because, right, we're softening buildings. We're taking, we're making sure we're going to look at egress points, taking bars, throwing ladders. We got to be constantly walking that area to make sure that we have the best entrance possible to get somebody to go down. And if we send three guys in, and shit goes sideways, who's outside to be ready? So there's, there's some, it's a great debate. Right. But I still think that Rick should be outside ready to spring into action. Because if they're inside, what are they doing? Are they radio communication again? How many, was like, I had the numbers, was like 37% of Maydays were missed on the radio? Right. Yeah. Yeah. That's right. So 
if we have our Rick crew inside working on a hose line, doing a search, and then Mayday is called, our Rick team's not missing for it. They're so when I say interior Rick, I just mean the people that are already in there. Not, I'm not, I don't mean like having an actual interior writ. I mean, okay. uh, if people aren't self-rescuing, then it's the people on the line or the truckies in there already doing a search that when they hear it, usually end up finding the down firefighter, lost firefighter. So I just call them an interior writ. Okay. It's just, just a, a stupid phrase. I probably should have clarified that. My point is, if we trained people that move in that line, that if there is a mayday, if they stay oriented and they have the resources and they can do it, why not? Why, why not add to that training? Absolutely. I, probably, I should have been more, more clear on that. I'm sorry about that. My wife says I'm stupid. I think she's right. I think she's right. You know, so the way you clarify that uh, makes more sense. If we have people inside and they hear the mayday, well, obviously their main job is if they're on the hose line, what are they supposed to be doing? Right. But that's, see, that's the training, though. That's the decision making. And, uh, you know, 10 years ago, uh, it was a very, well, 15 years ago, it was a very default setting fire service, right? I go in, I do this, period, end of story. I don't think. Now we're thinking, right? So now you're searching off a uh, hand line. You're doing a long side and a short side uh, search. Uh, maybe you've got, you know, an, a you know, a team of four on a truck. You got two searching this way, two searching that way. And they're the ones that if if we train them right to, to listen to the radio, like you're saying, uh, and to know how they're oriented and know how to use. Now, think about this. We have transfill capabilities on our bottles. So if right. we practice our air management, if we practice our communication, if we practice our orientation, then why could we not go to that firefighter and help them, whether we remove them or not? We can at least get well, them air or give them comfort, and then the outside writ can come in and get all the damn glory, if you ask me. But, well, I, I, think I think that's already happening. Uh, I think you've already kind of nailed it. If I'm inside a building and somebody calls for help, a mayday goes on, and I'm on my hose line, a crew of three, and they're really right next door in the building or the room next to me, how could I not go and, and take care of them? My officer is going to say, or going to make that command, aware of where our location is, where we're right next door to that firefighter, we can take care of that. Mm-hmm. That should be happening. If I'm inside that building and I can really go around the corner and find that guy who needs help, then yeah, we should be doing that. Sure. The fire but, should not be ignored. So if you got two guys in that hose line, we could send another guy to check out. And like you said, I can start using my air. And right. if he needs air, I can start curling up his bottle. See, I think it's an easy call for like a truck or rescue company doing search. They can easily say, yes, I'm going to go to him. The question becomes for the fire attack team is if, if I'm close enough, if I know my job, putting that fire out, is that going to be the best thing for that firefighter? Or do I need to go straight to the firefighter because I'm nowhere near the fire yet? That, that thinking, right? That thinking firefighter, you can't just default setting either one of those like, oh, I'm just on a hand line. I must go to fire or, oh, I heard a mayday. I must go straight to mayday. You have to figure out what is going to make the situation better for that firefighter? Is it going straight to him or is it go putting the fire out? It, it's a complicated series of, of like a huge flow chart. It's it, the old days. It used to be, you know, three or four boxes. Now it's like hundreds and hundreds of boxes. So many decisions you have to make. If you understand fire behavior, if you understand building construction, if you understand how to move a hose through a building, you're already putting all, you know, a huge amount of, of checks in their favor, right? Not just for down firefighters, but for victims. So my point in all of this, I guess I'm saying, if we trained a little bit harder on some of these things, if we learned to pack them into that same thinking firefighter's box, then we can make those decisions. But I feel like sometimes we don't make the right decisions based on a default setting. Does that make sense? Absolutely. Again, it if you were to say I'm an idiot, it's okay. I'm used to it. I'll leave here. I'll go upstairs ahead of my wife. She'll say, you're an idiot. I'm like, yeah. Uh. <laughs> it's a great topic to discuss. I mean, we could talk about that for another two hours. Oh, yeah. Oh, absolutely. <laughs> I think that, unfortunately, command has that ultimate decision. And that's a tough decision to have. It is a tough decision to have, especially if command does not have a – it goes right back to communication. It doesn't have a good picture of what's going on inside. 
it, so it, if you do it, now you're charged with freelancing. Right now you're charged yeah. with breaking those rules. Right. right. So uh, where do you go with that? If you go, command's not listening to me. They don't know what's going on inside this room. I'm going to do it anyway. Right. The outcome is good, which is fantastic. But what if the outcome is bad? Now you're catching shit. You're doing something he told you deliberately not to do. Yep. So that's a, that's a tough one. Man, it is. It's that complicated flow chart like I'm talking about. My answer isn't a thousand percent right. Your answer is a thousand percent right. It is a very complicated, a very just intense subject because you're dealing with a, it's a very emotional subject too, right? So it's hard to take the emotion out of it. So if, if you look at it through that lens, it's easy for this conversation to go straight to emotions, right? And I don't know that we can afford emotions when it comes to a down firefighter or a lost firefighter. That's where our training and our focus needs to be as opposed to the emotional side of it. I'm not saying don't be emotional about it when time is right, but emotions can easily cloud your judgment. And we got to remember why we're there. Absolutely. 100%. If you've never been in it, how do you know you're going to react? Yes. Your heart rate is going almost 200 beats per minute. You're not thinking clearly. This guy's screaming in the other room for help. The job is telling you to go that way because you've got to kill the fire. But you know your buddy is over there. Right. It's, that's a hard, a hard pill to swallow. You can't go over there to finish, to help them out. You've got to finish the fire over there. Some of the best things I've seen this, it, have been in the bathrooms. Hold on, that didn't sound right. Some of the best little <laughs> sayings I've seen were in bathrooms and firehouses that were like, you know, potty training stuff that's like ab above the urinal. And I saw one, I was in Michigan just like a week ago, and it said, uh, it was a quote from some Navy SEAL. It said, you don't rise to the occasion, you sink to your training. And it goes back to what we pretty much started this talking about, uh, Rit, is that it, it's training. It's, you got to build that muscle memory. And if anybody out there plays golf, you know exactly what I'm talking about. You know, you could, you practice, you practice, you practice, and you do everything you can to hit that ball straight. And the only way you can consistently hit that ball straight is through that training. And fire service is no different, right? You got to yep. practice pulling the hose. You got to practice moving the hose. You got to practice breathing. Something as simple as breathing. You got to practice putting your gear on. I, I had somebody who I respect the shit out of tell me that, why are you having these new recruits? come out on the shift and still have to do bunker drills. I'm like, cause it's that important. If we Absolutely. can save them 10 seconds in the firehouse and put 10 seconds on, on little Timmy's uh, in, with the Spider-Man pajamas on his clock, what, that's a win, right? And if you can do 10 seconds, you could probably do 15 and on and on and on. And I feel like in the fire service, sometimes training is looked at as basic or advanced, which it isn't. Uh, was it Jim McCormick said, um, hold on. I got it. Uh, there's no basic skills. There's only mastery of, uh, there's no advanced skills. There's only mastery of the basics. So that falls right in line with that. And RIT is just an amalgam of basic skills, right? It really is. And it really if, you, is. Yeah. if you practice RIT, you're really practicing a lot of different skills. You get a lot, mm -hmm. you get a lot, a big bang for your buck with RIT training, I think. Uh, I, I love RIT training. And I'm always signing up for those courses because I want to learn as much as I can. Yeah. But also, not just learning, but getting into the shit, getting in your gear, going through those props, pushing yourself to those physical limits. Mm -hmm. It sucks. Yep. And as I've gotten older, it sucks even more. <laughs> but I still love it. Like the, the Fireground Survival class, the last day we had to do the confidence course, and I got hung up on the wire prop. Kicked my ass. I didn't give up. Pushing through, but I finished it. I ran out of air towards the very last. I almost made it out the door. Ran out of air. Uh, it's a humbling experience. I've been doing this for twelve years, but that course still can humble you. And I will keep doing that because if the young guys are going to do it, I'm going to do it. And if I'm going to teach it, I got to do those skills too. I'm not above anybody else. Uh, a captain's not above anybody else. And it, the senior guy, if you're going to put the gear on and you get assigned Rick, you've got to be ready to, to go in the shit and do something. Right. 
I want you saving my ass. I want competent, physically fit men or women to be able to know how to go into a house, find me, and assess me, and take me home to my wife and kids. That's where it comes out. That was great. That was <laughs> that's a bumper sticker right there. That's as simple as it gets, brother. I love it. <laughs> All right. So we're gonna you know how we wrap up. We wrap up with what's the best firehouse prank that you have played or have had played on you. So the best one I was just talking about before is taking a shit. Good one. Enjoying my morning coffee. And quiet. Nothing's going on. I hear the door slowly creak open. And then I get blasted with the uh, dry cap. And they love doing that to me because I scream when I'm scared. <laughs> I scream like a little schoolgirl. And i embarrassed to say it's happened more than once. <laughs> nice. Nice. Uh, but I've never played a prank on anybody else. I've never been oh, creative come enough. On. Come so, uh, on. That means you've done such be- bad pranks. <laughs> that you're embarrassed to bring them up. Is that what it is? I don't even know. I honestly can't think. Of, the only one of the pranks I played on was a guy had this Mustang. And the color was called Deep Impact. So he used to bust his balls all the time because the color was Deep Impact. Right. But he left his car in lots in the firehouse lot. And he had cologne in there. So we doused it with uh, all of his colognes into his car. Oh. So it smelled like a French whorehouse inside of deep impact. Ah. <laughs> oh my god! I think I might I might lose my shit on that one. Yeah, he wasn't very happy when he got in the car, but we laughed. <laughs> you laughed. That's all that matters, right? That's all that mattered. Well, brother, I appreciate you being on. I've had a blast. Stay safe, and again, thanks for being on my podcast. Thank you for having me, sir. Today's podcast was sponsored by Fire Facilities, industry-leading designers and manufacturers of realistic, built-to-last training structures for more than 30 years. Make your training count. Visit firefacilities.com for more information.